In this episode of Between the Lines, IDS Research Fellow John Gaventa interviews Ben Jackson and Harriet Lamb, authors of the book From Anger to Action, Inside the Global Movements for Social Justice, Peace and a Sustainable Planet. Drawing on candid insights from citizens, activists and innovators, and their own experiences as leaders of internationally recognised advocacy organisations, the authors give an insider account of the battle for change and how it can be won, as well as trenchant criticism of where traditional civil society has lost its way and needs renewal. Welcome everyone. Our guests today are Ben Jackson and Harriet Lamb, who have written a inspiring new book entitled From Anger to Action, Inside the Global Movements for Social Justice, Peace and a Sustainable Planet. In this book, Ben and Harriet reflect on their rich experiences over several decades as leaders and activists in a range of social movements. They also draw on the insights from many other activists, academics, and citizens to give an insightful and hopeful account of how change can happen, especially when led from below through determined citizen action. Building on a brief history of citizen organizing over the last decade, the authors then look at how such action has made a difference in critical issues of our time, climate change, peace building, immigration and displacement, inequality, and countering pandemics, starting with HIV AIDS and more recently COVID. Both Ben and Harriet are well-placed personally to write on these issues. Their experience as organizers spans several continents and multiple campaigns and several decades. I can't summarize it all now, but currently Ben Jackson is director of the Asylum Reform Initiative, the team behind a new coalition campaign called Together with Refugees. In the past, he has led an NGO network on global poverty, shelter housing campaigns, and crisis action coalitions to perfect, protect civilians in conflict. Harriet Lamb is CEO of Ashton, which supports pioneers of climate solutions worldwide. She was previously CEO of International Alert and Fair Trade, first in the UK and then internationally. Ben and Harriet, thank you so much for joining us on Between the Lines uh, today. I really enjoyed reading the book, but you're both busy people, um, very involved in running important organizations and your own campaigns. What inspired you to step back and write this book and, and what brought the two of you together to do so? Well, I, th I think partly it's the times we live in, John. Um, I, I, I think many people, uh, including ourselves, feel sort of torn between kind of the deep concern that we have about the times we live in, the movements that have bubbled up um, across the world in the last 10 years, particularly since the last financial crisis. I suppose we wanted to put the case that we feel, despite all the dark clouds, that we feel there is a case for hope. Uh, and that's kind of what we try to do uh, in this book. Well, I guess the book opens with a scene in Bristol Harbour where mm. a group of people have come down and they're pulling on a statue of Edward Coulston, a slave trader. And we felt that symbolised the moment that we were in, where there were all these issues coming together and people were really tackling them head on and that we felt we had seen that increase in people's taking to the streets and leading movements whether it was Black Lives Matter or whether it was the school strikers and Extinction Rebellion or whether it was looking at the Arab Spring and what happened there this sense that there was a new mood among people to take to the streets to tackle head on the issues that we were facing and at the same time it wasn't just on the streets it was also you had the rise of the new digital first campaigners people trying new ways to campaign there and of course you had those people who were helping show how things could be different helping create the living alternatives whether it's through issues like fair trade um, or support or welcoming refugees and so we really felt it was a moment in history, that we stand in a moment in history that both you get this upsurge in people's activism, but also that we face these four global crises converging together. And, and the ones we explore in the book are around rising inequality, the climate crisis, 
rising levels of conflict and that leading to more and more people being displaced, becoming refugees. And we tried to explore and lay out in the book how those four fires, we call it the four fires that are burning and they're all connected and they're all feeding each other. And so how can we as citizens responding equally respond in a way that connects the different issues that we're grappling with? Certainly timely and timely to bring a, a message of hope, but that you're absolutely right. These, these are critical issues and increasingly in intersecting. But you're, you don't just focus on the current, you, you go back historically. And actually in the beginning of the book, you, you tell the story of one of your first actions together, a story I didn't know about a landmark case in 1994, which came before the High Court in London and which you won. Um, so an important victory, which still has ramifications for today. Early in our careers as campaigners in a, in a sort of probably little known kind of uh, campaign organization called the World Development Movement, who did very sort of, you know, worthy work on, on those key development issues, trade and aid and so on. And we'd been involved in many years uh, to do that and put pressure to change the direction of, of the British aid and it affected many other countries as well that was very heavily coloured by foreign policy interests, military interests. I mean, it was sort of a, a kind of taken that aid should be part of that. Um, and so we'd worked away on this campaign. And this particular kind of seminal issue came up, which was around this um, dam in Malaysia called the Pergao Dam. The then British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher, had done a sort of secret deal uh, with the, the Malaysian Prime Minister saying, well, we'll build this dam, even though their own civil servants were saying it's grotesquely uneconomic, um, in exchange for, the, uh, for Malaysia buying a bunch of warplanes from, from Britain. And all this only came out later. And, and I think um, it, it was one of these things where we worked away on it and several uh, parliamentary committees, media work, and then we, finally we we did this crazy thing uh, to to take the government to court. I mean, if nothing else, just to make the point. I don't know how much we actually expected to win, but we we did win, as you say, John. And the result of that was the government was forced to return two hundred and thirty four million pounds to the British aid budget for for better use. But it was also one of those tipping point moments when the whole aid trade provision, this sort of slush fund within the aid project uh, budget, um, kind of fell apart and, and eventually was abolished. You know, things fall into your lap and you have to take chances. All sorts of different tactics add up to the insider and the outsider, legal and other things. And that you, you have to be and you have to be ambitious. And a small, tiny organization like that could help break the camel's back and bring that change, which, as you say, has as, as, as kind of lasted until at least the re recent period. And it really did change our lives, the painters, and the belief that big change was possible, um, even if you were just a small citizens group. It's an inspiring story and, and one that, like you say, when today when aid is in such flux um, and seems to be shifting directions, perhaps one that we need to go back to and look at that, both the campaign and the, the high court case that, that led to some important changes. Harriet. I think that's really right, John, because I think the other learning of it is you have to keep pushing on an issue. And at that time, when we took the high court case and risked all for the well development movement, we really uh, staked the house on it. Uh, the Department for International Development was part of the Foreign Office. And partly because of this case, it got created into a separate and we all became very proud, I think, of DFID or the Department for International Development. And then, of course, 0.7 was enshrined and the legislation made it absolutely clear from then on that aid had to be focused on tackling poverty. And, you know, we probably all took our eye off the ball. We probably all got too comfortable too used to what became a cross-party consensus, apparently, and probably stopped putting the case strongly enough. And instead, many of the big establishment NGOs indeed began to get lots of resources from government. And again, that meant they were probably much closer to government than they had been. And consequently, we were probably all sleeping at the wheel when gradually the right wing began more and more strongly to put the case that actually uh, aid 
they, they started to argue a relentless campaign against aid, which led finally to the suspending of 0.7% as our national commitment and putting once again the aid department under the Foreign Office, which means it's in service of our other national and trade and military interests which is against everything that the aid budget should be for. So I think it's a really strong lesson in you can never for one moment rest because those people who don't agree with you and maybe pursue a much more nationalistic agenda, in this case, not an internationalist vision, they're not resting. And so therefore you have to keep pushing and campaigning and putting your case and going straight on to the next uh, change you want to achieve, the next progression forward. And we'd probably all rested on our laurels a bit too much in development. Mm. Though your book, as you've already pointed out, actually recounts um, not rest, but a huge amount of activism um, on, on critical issues of, of our time. And you've, in a way, already summarized the, the book. But, and we'll come to some, ex some of those examples of some of those campaigns. But is there anything more you want to say about the, the core argument of why of why you think citizen action is so critical at this point in time and, and how it differs and what difference it can make compared to other forms of professional advocacy or legal action or parliamentary engagement? Well, the other reason we wrote the book was because we just felt there's not enough attention paid to the role of citizen action in creating change. Mm. So uh, certainly in the UK, um, people pour over the minutiae of who had a cup of tea with who in the House of Commons and who was seen talking to who and who's up, who's down, an extraordinary level of detail about party politics. And yet, on the other hand, you get practically no reporting of how the big social movements of our time are helping shape and transform what we think and how we act and what becomes possible to bring forward legislatively. And that's why we wanted to also lay out uh, how, how absolutely critical citizen action can be, but also to encourage and stimulate thinking in the sector. We didn't want this book to be uh, a round of happy stories where we all sit back and clap. We were trying to really stimulate thinking about critical reflection really on what has worked and what hasn't worked and where are the big challenges that we face and where is that new systems thinking that we need what does that mean so what one of the issues that we really grapple with for example is that if all these issues are connected then the solutions need to be connected too but how do you work on that because we all know that one of the most successful tactics if you like of campaigning is to be focused but if you're focused then how can you possibly be tackling and climate change and international inequality uh, and conflict so that's a real problem that I think we feel civil society needs to keep grappling with. Uh, and we tell the stories of, of some inspiring examples where absolutely people have sought to do both. So, so, so to give you one example from the, um, the climate movement, if you like, uh, is a great organization based in South London in Brixton mm. called Repowering. And they're very committed to helping engage people in the solutions to climate change. This idea that you can pre-configure the bigger changes you want to see from national policy change, not just by lobbying for it, but by showing it, that bringing it to life. And so they worked in these uh, quite difficult estates, housing estates in, in Brixton, with the community to, to have the first solar panels on social housing in the country. But they did it in a way that absolutely engaged young people because they offered them uh, training opportunities, they were properly paid, they helped uh, engage them and indeed worked with the sort of matriarchs of the estate to help bring people along with them. As one example of how if you're going to both tackle the climate crisis through solar panels, you also need to be tackling inequality by helping make sure that the people who actually have to choose between heating and eating are part of developing the solutions, that you help tackle the fuel poverty that they face so that they can also see the gains from taking action on the climate. And that's just one of the, the many examples of the stories that we tell in the book. But 
all the time struggling to think how can we as movements find those more systemic answers to the problems that we face. That's a, that's a great example. And, and in our own work at IDS on inequality, we talk about the multiple forms of inequality and, and economic inequality, environmental inequality, um, social inequalities, racial inequalities, and how they intersect. And I think your book continue, you know, constantly reminds us um, of that. But on speaking of climate, uh, Harriet, I know you were um, there at Glasgow at the recent uh, COP26. Um, what's your assessment of that, bringing your thesis to bear? Uh, how did citizen, what impact did citizen action have on, on the outcomes of that event? And, and what, was most, really what good... was most significant, uh, you know, what, uh, about that action? Well, it's a, it's a really good question that everybody in the environmental sector is still sort of wrestling with, because I think we all feel a bit like one of those absolutely tiny, very, very bouncy balls that little children have, because one minute you can actually think, wow, look at all that progress that was achieved. You know, there was a commitment to phase down fossil fuels, which was never in before. There was a commitment to come back in a year's time to ratchet up people's commitments. There was progress on issue after issue, and it was absolutely clear that all that progress was thanks to the pressure from civil society. There wasn't, I think there wasn't a talk I went to where people didn't speak about the pressure from young people in particular, didn't reference that, didn't credit it, didn't talk about the impact that that had had and the sense of urgency that they felt. So on the one hand, you would think, fantastic this is what the movement has achieved that was probably unthinkable a few years ago and on the other hand that little tiny ball bounces straight back down again and you think yeah but it's not good enough and the sort of best summary of that really was by Cristiano Figueres who was of course the leading figure in making sure the Paris Agreement made such huge steps forward and and she said it's a it, it's a bit like there's a bus hurtling towards your child if you take a few steps forward, that's good, but it's not good enough to save your child. If you're gonna save your child from that bus, you have got to hurl yourself with every ounce of energy that you've got to snatch the child out of the way of the bus. And we didn't do that. So the deal's not good enough. So we still face an existential crisis. So it's a really hard balancing act. And I think you, in a way, perhaps it sums up quite nicely the problem that I think many of us feel in people's movements that quite often you do take huge steps forward and yet is it good enough does it last does it hold and I thought a, a very poignant example actually is that we tell the story in the book about the protest in Sudan and the change that they wrought and just in the past few weeks we've heard again about yes. uh, the military taking power in Sudan so that sort of sums up again this sense that you have to keep the persistence. The persistence that is demanded of people is so strong. And I think the other thing that everyone felt coming out of um, out of COP26 was, well, we can only expect so much of world leaders. We've got to double down. We've now got to throw everything we've got at making sure COP27 in Africa really addresses the global inequalities and injustice of you just mentioned John of climate inequalities, that we really make sure the money is on the bank, in the banks to uh, help developing countries make those transitions. But at the same time, we've actually got to redouble our efforts to create change every day. We can't wait for governments. We've got to get on with it, whether in our communities, whether in our own personal lives, or whether with our local authorities, all the other ways that we can help create change and tackle the climate crisis without waiting for government. Absolutely, and I think one of the challenges of measuring, you're constantly being asked uh, as an academic about how do we measure the impact of citizen action? Of course, the, the other relevant question is what would have been the, the outcomes without that citizen action? Yeah, the and I think we always yeah. have to keep that counterfactual um, yeah. in mind. So Ben, I mean, you you've, or spending your life now on another absolutely critical and, and almost seemingly intractable global issue, which is the rise of, of displacement of, and ref, growing from conflicts around the world. Um, again, that can be approached through 
global legal treaties and international and, and governmental action. But you're making a case here of the importance for citizen action on dealing with mm. displacement and refugee and asylum issues. Um, how can citizen action address this, this really difficult and tragic issue that we see in the media every day? Yeah, and I think that while Harriet's right, uh, that the climate movement is certainly an ascendancy. The question is, will it be, is it ascendant enough to meet the scale of the ch challenge? I think in, in, on, the, on the refugee issue, we wouldn't even go that far. <laughs> we, we have been on the back foot and obviously that's got um, worse and is right at the epicenter of the rise of national populism. Many of us who've worked for many years on international issues have been used to sort of pushing from the outside to get it into be a kind of core issue. On this one, it's it's a core issue, but we are not winning. And, the, and I think the only thing I'd say about that is, and that's the initiative I'm involved in, is that that has forced us, citizens' movements, NGOs, large and small, local and national, to really reevaluate our strategy. And that's really what this has come from. And it's a new strategy, uh, which is First of all, a coalition strategy. So it is the most ambitious coalition built, uh, called together with refugees, nearly 400 organizations of all kinds, not just refugee organizations, faith organizations, business organizations, LGBT organizations, housing organizations. So first of all, this coming together, we have to come together. I think the strategy has been formed by the fact that we have to go out there win the public argument, win hearts and minds, win the battle for values. You know, it's been quite a about turn for NGOs used to an era where we make rational kind of, I mean, we're still rational, don't worry, we still believe in evidence, but by making those cases often behind closed doors, we will win the day. And we were just not in that era. We are in the era of trying to uh, kind of win that battle for hearts. Actually last week, uh, the government's, you know, um, you know, extremely aggressive and poisonous piece of legislation, the Nationality and Bill, went through the House of Commons with a huge majority, um, which would basically see the right to asylum, you know, absolutely eviscerated in this country. So we are under no illusions. But what I would take as a small piece of comfort from that is that that has forced us to reevaluate and re and we're starting that strategy. The temptation, and George Lakey, um, an American activist uh, that John, you know, you'll know, he talks about the, the parallel with the LGBT movement in the 80s. He talks about being involved in that movement. And the temptation was when AIDS was seen as the gay plague and it was the height of the Reaganism and so on, was that we just need to hunker down and defend what's ours. Says that was the LGBT movement decided not to do that. And it's one of the movements that has been most successful in the last two or three decades. And I think we're trying to take a, a leaf out of that, that we have to fight back and fight for what we're for, us defending, um, you know, against the latest attacks. Well, as you say, it, it points to the issue that, that, that solutions here aren't simply about changing policy, are they? They're about changing hearts and minds. They're about changing values and, and norms. And I wonder if that brings us, I'll come back to another question later, later but, but in the final chapter of the book, I think you, you develop that, that philosophy uh, a bit more when you point to the three wheels of change, battle, build, and believe. Can you explain a little bit more about what, what you mean by this? Uh, what's important about each of these, battle, build, and believe? Yeah, well, I, I think to start with the point of belief there, I mean, that's really what I was just talking about there, that, that you know, values, almost hesitate to say this because everyone's sort of like, well, of course, NGOs, and so they're all about values. But I, I, I'm always constantly amazed by how we are completely purpose-based organizations and business and everybody else in on that act. And somehow we conspire to turn into being sort of managerialist organizations that squeeze a lot of that out. So we do need to put that up front. So the values such as hope, such as empowerment, such as collaboration. I mean, we are very much in a very basic battle here. Is this about competing? Do we try and grab the vaccines and bring them to ourselves? Or is it about collaboration? And that's right from the street level, you know, which way do we go through to the international level? I think the other big pieces that we say in terms of the model of change is what we call battle. That's the piece around campaigning for change that we've talked about. Um, that, you know, uh, what are the strategies there um, that we look at about campaigning that, that is modern and forward looking? We need to move on. So, for example, 
bring the power of digital organizing, which has transformed campaigning as it's transformed society together with sort of in-person organizing. And I think there's very exciting stuff, uh, the kind of whole big organizing approach that, that, for example, has been seen particularly in the, the US around the, the revival of the Democrats and so on. Uh, the big NGOs are recognizing the importance of movements. And one of the things I suppose the book is a call for is connecting those strategies because we tend to sort of see them as separate, that, oh, I'm a campaigner or I'm a person who builds alternatives. And if one thing we could say is like in different critical areas, how we can we bring those together, not just the issues as we were talking about, the connections between climate and inequality, but also the strategies for change need to need to have all of those together. And often, often they don't, and the funders fund different things, and the structures inspire against us joining that up. And I think that really is critical the future. But I would say one of the points of hope we take is that particularly, I think, a generation, the younger generation, really have taken this idea of building alternatives to their heart. You know, it's sort of second nature in a way that I think Harriet and I would feel like we had to battle for this, whether Harriet's work on fair trade or whatever. I think that's right what you to mention fair trade then Ben because I think that's a very good example mm -hmm. of uh, a, something that's both a campaign because first people had to campaign to get fair trade products to be available to get companies to offer fair trade and then to use the fact that the public were buying fair trade and was showing very strongly through their actions in the shopping aisle where their values felt to use that to then campaign more widely for all trade to be fairer and to push for a living income for farmers and workers in the developing world on whom we depend so that through that act of buying your fair trade tea or coffee or chocolate, you're making a direct impact, but as important, you're sending that signal about the wider shifts that you want to see. And I think it's looking for those campaign examples that both battle and build perhaps at the same time. I really like the, the fact that you've brought in the, the, the build aspect of this and, and this um, in the area of, I've done a lot of work around the uh, economy and the alternative economies that are emerging. Mm -hmm. um, particularly after the crash in 2008, the, the rise of the social economy a, a, around the world, which is growing and is, is larger than it's ever been. And we can see that in many other areas. You, you pointed, Ben, to the, the rise of renewable energy, which has actually done more, I think, to shift the targets uh, of, of what we can expect in terms of uh, reduction of, 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 of uh, carbon dioxide and so on in the environment than formal government policies have but somehow they have to be joined up. And, and this, I think, is a point that you, you've talked about, Harriet, about the need to join up across campaigns. But how do you join up between the grassroots and the, the more structural kind of, of policy advocacy and change? I know you both talk sometimes about the tension between more professionalized NGOs who play in, in that turf of, of, of high level policy change and the, the energy on the streets. Uh, what does your book teach us about how to join up uh, vertically from the streets all the way up to? Well, I wonder if one of the strong examples of that is the push for the shift away from fossil fuels to be a just transition. And I think that work on the just transition, which obviously you've also worked on a lot, John, um, came from the trade union movement saying we're behind this we need to we've got to respond to the climate crisis but we can't do it in a way that leaves the workers left behind and that they pay the price for us to transition and therefore that the transition must be just and I actually think that's a very strong example that they put forward the framing they put forward the campaign message they won strong support from a policy point of view that therefore you need a green new deal you need massive government interventions with the policy and the finance to enable communities to transition and indeed one of the good things to come out of cop 26 was indeed the idea of a, a just transition plan with south africa with finance flowing into that to enable all those coal people who absolutely depend on coal mines coal mining to be able to shift away and find new careers and new futures and but when that's done once again as or as part of that process it more than ever we'll need to be looking for those new economic models because otherwise we, we, we cannot just continue doing more of the same but without fossil fuels we've got to find a whole new way to recreate the economy and so more than ever we need those new examples and 
we actually mention in the book that uh, Michael Jacobs, who used to be an advisor on uh, green economic policy to the previous Labour government, sort of writing about now there's an openness perhaps to more radical economic options than there has been for many years. The sort of end of history has in fact ended and people are desperate to find new solutions that address people's anger at inequality and recognize the need to, trans to, to make these changes. And I think we, we wrote our book as COVID was hitting. And I think that again underlined the extent to which people are hungry for new ways. They, mm. the, the, the rising up of people's willingness to volunteer in their communities, to work in the community shop, to help with vaccinations, to help out their neighbors. You had this real sense of a flowering of energy among people. And so what we've got to do then is find the right economic frameworks for that to happen. And clearly, we're still a very long way away from that, which yeah. comes back to that importance of challenging and reflecting and pushing ourselves all the time to say, yes, lovely, but not enough. Thanks, Ben. What do you want to add about this, this theme of, of linking the, the alternatives and the grassroots energy to large to policy change and structural change? I mean, I, I do think slowly, slowly, uh, some of the kind of bigger NGOs and the more established kind of structured NGOs are kind of recognizing it. It, it, it is too slow and it's, it's, it's kind of a, a process. As we were saying earlier about, about, about aid, I mean, you know, the, the, the fact is that we, we neglected our grassroots in the International Development Organization. We became too kind of complacent and we're now paying the price for that because when people started turning around in a way that we never expected saying, well, we just don't believe in aid. Why should we help people on the other side? Asking these very basic questions. What are those alternatives that are really trying to chart a fundamental alternative that do ultimately challenge the system? And I know Harriet faced a lot of those kind of battles you know, within the wider international development movement about fair trade. Well, oh, that's just a sort of window dressing for the supermarkets when in fact lay behind it, you know, all the all the organizations, cooperatives, unions and others in developing countries, which many people didn't recognize. And that's a constant challenge, isn't it? Because you never know. And Harriet, I suspect when you started, we were very involved in the early days of fair trade, whether that actually would become a, a tipping point idea which could grow and as it's grown enormously or whether it would somehow become co-opted and, and, and so on. And we never really know, I think, until you give it time and, and energy. Looking, just recognizing our own time, um, if, if I can just ask maybe a final question or two. I mean, you're very, the book is optimistic uh, and you've talked a lot about hope um, and yet, and we need that in, in this day and time and you need that for, for action. And yet all the problems you've talked about um, persist and, and grow deeper. Inequalities increase, the effects of severe climate change are upon us, the refugee crisis spreads, pandemic continues to spread. How can you be so optimistic? And, and, and where in this do you personally, where do you draw your own hope from? Well, perhaps I could kick off. Um, Duncan Green wrote a review of our book and he uh, sort of, um, misquotes Gramsci saying what we, he hopes this book offers is realism of the intellect, not pessimism, realism of the intellect with optimism of the will. And I guess that's where both Ben and I feel that we are, we have to be realistic about the scale of the challenges that we face and just how tough it is. And in our book, we do talk about some examples where, for example, the fossil fuel industry has spent millions and millions and millions challenging uh, NGOs, challenging the data that we know, for example, that all around the world, Human Rights Watch um, or Global Witness catalog the numbers of people who get killed for standing up for their beliefs and for pushing forward progress. So we have to be, absolutely tough and realistic and if we're going to get the shifts we need we know we have to have that optimism of the will and I I think we get it from all the successes we have seen and I wanted to go back to sort of challenging what you said earlier John when you sort of said well there's the counterfactual we never know the counterfactuals that's true what would have happened without the school strikers for example but we also have seen many examples where campaigns you can directly draw a correlation from what a campaign set out to do and the result 
and some examples would be, for example, on um, extraordinary progress on LGBTQ2 rights, extraordinary progress in our lifetime. Uh, ben and I saw the ending of apartheid and then an extraordinary campaign that we tell uh, about making sure that people can get drugs to counter HIV AIDS without having to pay patents and the phenomenal extortionate prices. A brilliant campaign that directly led to those drugs being available to people and enabling them to um, live much longer lives. Uh, and another example we, we, we tell actually is of, um, of, a, of a, again, a different approach, which is um, the story of someone called Mark Campanale and Carbon Tracker the power of an idea here. So here's someone who was worrying away about the fact it's actually the finance that is enabling fossil fuels to continue to, that, to be so strong in our societies and economies. And if you could pull out the financial rug, that would be what would trigger change. And he came up with this concept of the stranded assets, the idea that if you invest your money in fossil fuels, actually your money is going to be stranded because the world is gonna move away from fossil fuels and you will actually lose out financially. And there is absolutely no question that having come up with the concept of stranded assets and of the carbon bubble, and that campaign then also being taken up by the grassroots, by 350.org and Bill McGibbon in the US saying, do the math. And that whole sort of movement that came up behind it has helped shift markets away from fossil fuels. And you can just watch every day trillions moving out. It does make you wonder how many trillions there are left. But nonetheless, <laughs> it has a, had a direct impact. And so I think it's all those examples that have given both Ben and I that optimism that we can get there. But we do have to be very realistic because there is no question about the scale of how difficult the situation is now and the rise of populism, which although Trump may now be out of power, he, he wasn't when we started writing the book, but of course around the world, we've got so many populist leaders pushing back on uh, more liberal agendas. And so the importance of us thinking together of those successful strategies that will achieve change has never been more urgent. But the other thing is people, John. I mean, ultimately, um, you know, of course, we're many forces move things in society, you know, technology and economics and that. But we do feel that citizens, you know, organizing an action is such an under, under, you know, uh, examined area. I, I mean, with with great exceptions like yourself and some others, even in the academic team field, but people is critical. And that's one of the things we felt very privileged to have met so many people in many different countries, you know, extraordinarily more difficult circumstances, you know, those who are fighting, can you imagine, working for peace in Syria in the middle of the civil war, uh, those who were involved in the Arab Spring and so on, and taught, you know, just in the book, we try to and, and, and uh, you know, give opportunity for those people to speak um, in, in the interviews and others that we that we have in there. And I think that's the other source of inspiration. It's the lessons of history and it's people who make that happen of all kinds all around the world. Uh, that's what ultimately keeps us going and what, what, what hope is about. And hope is founded on those those two things, I think. And we need hope for action and we need hope to keep us going in these difficult times. And thank you so much for for giving it to us in what uh, I think you've, if I could, what you've given us is evidence-based reasons for being optimistic. Yep. Um, not, as you say, romantic, sizing the difficulties, but giving us concrete evidence of where real change has, has happened. As you know, I worked for many years at the Highlander Center in the United States before coming to IDS, which of course was a grassroots training center that played a key role in social movements, the labor movement, the civil rights movement, the early days of the environmental movement. And Miles Horton, the director there, the founder there, when I was there, used to remind us that, that not every action is going to contribute to the next movement, but it hopefully will become a building block. It will build people, it will build ideas, it will change beliefs and hearts and minds. And when you get enough of those building blocks in place at the right point in time, bigger change happens. And I, I think that you, by giving us these rich case studies across so many issues in so many places, You've given us uh, a lot of evidence about why even in tough times, we can be optimistic 
and continue to promote the idea of the importance of citizen action from below. So thank you. Thanks very much. I encourage people to, to pick up this book, uh, have a read. Uh, it's, uh, it's one that can be read in the evening, read on the couch, read as you travel, and will we'll certainly give you energy to seek more action. So thank you for being with us. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe and share to help us spread the word. Do you have a great book we could feature in a future episode? Then get in touch on email at between the lines at ids.ac.uk. Thank you.